you would, let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 7 this evening. Mark chapter 7. On Sunday evenings for, I think this is the sixth lesson, we've been looking at the idea presented by Jesus here in Mark chapter 7 regarding exactly what defiles us. And the specific text comes from verses 18 down through verse 23. And what is, as we've talked about this, we're looking at it really from the standpoint as Jesus had intended it. That under the new covenant, our relationship with God would be that which would be based upon our faith in him, but established within an honest and sincere heart. You think about what Jesus said the Father was searching for. He was looking for those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we stop and think about where our obedience comes from and what really what motivates us in our service unto God. Now, what I mean by that, I'll explain a little, little better than what I just said. The children of Israel, when they were born physically, they were born automatically accountable to the law of God. Now, I realize they were infants, but their parents had to circumcise them. Their parents had to, had to uh, deal with them in the proper way according to the law. And as they got older, they had to learn the law. And then when they learned the law, they learned about sin. And then they learned about their accountability to God. Um, and then what you hope for is that they would then follow the law from the heart. Not all of them did. But when one becomes a Christian, it is based upon an obedience out of the heart. Obey from the heart that form of doctrine. It's because you were convicted and you consciously made the decision, a decision you made within your mind, within your heart, to become a child of God. Now, that establishes a relationship, a fellowship with our Heavenly Father that allows us to go before Him and worship Him and pray to Him and to walk in fellowship with Him. Much like the children of Israel had to be consecrated to go before the temple, we had to be consecrated by the blood of Jesus Christ so that we could have this fellowship with our Heavenly Father. But just as they could be defiled and would have to go through a cleansing process, Jesus is making the point here that they were worried about all the outward things defiling them and they were missing where true defilement came. You think about it, their defilement, they were worried about whether or not they could go to the temple. So they had to be washed properly. They had to be cleansed properly. While all along, these individuals were defiled before God, not physically, but spiritually. And that's Jesus' point here in Mark chapter 7, when he says what comes out from a man in verse 20, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. He says all these evil things come from within and defile a man. With tonight's lesson, I want to talk about defilement by pride. By pride. Now, we're not going to talk about pride from the standpoint of, you know, you really care the type of job that you do, and so you want to do it well. We, we understand that we kind of, people kind of look at pride in that way, have take pride in what you're doing. But we're talking about from a biblical perspective. And this particular word, pride, as is used in Mark chapter 7 there in verse 22, here's the Greek word and the definition there that follows. It primarily means pride or haughtiness would be another word. Arrogance would be a good word to use. Matter of fact, in the, American, in the King James translation, this word is found only once, this Greek word, and it's translated as pride. But the meaning can be pride, haughtiness, arrogance. But look at number two. The character of one who, with swollen estimate of his own powers or merits, looks down on others, and even treats them with insolence and contempt. He read from about four feet above everybody. Um, but this is the idea that we're talking about. The idea of an attitude, Jesus calls it pride. But we know it also as haughtiness and arrogance, where basically 
we have a high esteem of ourselves. Our estimation of our own powers or merits, as the definition says, are swollen, overinflated. And when we get to that point, then there's no hope for us in listening to things that could help us. When we get to that level of arrogance, that level of haughtiness, then we find ourselves being unwilling to submit and humble ourselves before the Father. Um, as we've already pointed out here in the text, we find that this pride is that which defiles the heart. You know, if an individual becomes a Christian, they obey the gospel's call unto salvation. They obey from the heart that form of doctrine. It's a great thing. But if somewhere along the line, they become arrogant, they become haughty, then they're no longer walking in fellowship with God. This is the concept there, there of defilement. They're no longer in fellowship with him until they get their heart right, until they get their attitude right with him. Now, we're going to talk about some of the problems of pride in the lesson tonight. One of the first things I want to notice, it does affect the way that we treat other people. And in this context, when I say the way we treat other people, I'm talking very specifically, of course, about our own brethren. But it would extend out towards those who are of the world but notice our responsibility. This is from Romans chapter 12. Observe there with me verses 3 through 5. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church there in Rome, here's our responsibility. He says, For I say, to the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to, the, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now remember the definition of swollen self-esteem of, of oneself? Well, that's contrary to what Paul is saying here, that we are not to think of ourselves more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members of the not, uh, all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. If you have an individual who becomes arrogant, who becomes haughty, they become very uh, filled with this pride, this, this, this overestimation of their, their own worth, you get a diatrophies, as John talks about. You get an individual who tries to rule everything, who tries to walk roughshod over everyone, and that's just not acceptable. It's not within the attitude that God has for us. Notice with the over in 3 John. I mentioned atrophies. Let's actually read about that. 3 John chapter 1, let's look at verses 9 and 10. Paul, or John here writes, he said, I wrote to the church. Think about this. An apostle wrote to the church. But Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. He loved to have the preeminence among them. Sounds like he had a swollen, overinflated opinion of himself to the point that he rejected the apostles. And John says as such in verse 10, therefore, if I come, I will call to mind the deeds which he does, praying against us with malicious words and not content with that. He himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to putting them out of the church. So we have a responsibility when it comes to working with one another. And we've talked about this before in many other lessons. But pride is something that becomes a hindrance to that. This type of pride, this all haughtiness, this arrogance, prevents us from working with one another the way that we should. Not just in regards to the work of the local church, but just in general, our lives together with one another. We've got to be willing to put aside such um, arrogance. Notice in, back to Romans chapter 12, verse 16. The pride here that we're talking about is going to prevent the following. Romans 12, verse 13, he says, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, there in Romans 12, verse 16, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Again, there's that concept there. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Don't be so, so over uh, a, a field with, uh, uh, as it says in the definition, swollen estimate of your own merit. We've got to look at one another the same and be of the same mind toward one another so that we can properly work together. Now, let's continue, though. There's more problems with pride, of course. And this is really where the danger comes in. I know it's a bad thing that it defiles our heart. 
And it's a bad thing that it will hinder our behavior with other Christians. But pride essentially stamps out humility. This type of pride that we're talking about, it prevents humility within the heart of the individual. Over in Jeremiah chapter 13, this is the passage that Isaac read for us for the scripture reading. You know, and I, I don't say, well, at all. So I'll say it for the first time in all these years. I really appreciate the men who read scriptures. The, you know, anybody can lead singing, but not everyone can read scriptures. I'm kidding, but I do appreciate our song leaders. But the men who are willing to stand up here and read scriptures, I really appreciate that. Um, because they're calling upon and leading us in, in spending that moment of time, whether it's three verses or ten verses, in the Word of God. And they always do a very, very good job with that. And I appreciate it. But in Jeremiah chapter 13, note there beginning in verse 15. Here's what he says to Judah. He says, hear and give ear. Notice the next words, do not be proud. Now the idea of this word proud here does go along with the idea of a self, maybe an inflation of one's ego, overestimation of one's worth and so forth. Hear and give ear. Do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God. He's kind of like saying, don't give glory to yourself. Give glory to the Lord your God before he causes darkness and before your feet stumble on the dark mountains. And while you are looking for light, he turns it into the shadow of death and makes it dense darkness. A lack of humility causes us to walk in darkness, a spiritual darkness. Whereas with humility, we turn to the Lord and we find the light. 17 says, but if you will not hear it, my soul will weep in secret for your pride, Jeremiah writes. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. If you wanted a, a, a reason why Judah went into captivity, Jeremiah identifies one of the causes right here, and that was pride. That was pride and arrogance, a haughtiness, a, a, a lack of humility before the Heavenly Father. Let's turn over and look at Jeremiah chapter 48. Obadiah also fell, not Obadiah, sorry, Edom. The nation of Edom fell within the same category or fell because of the same reason. Over in Jeremiah 48, let's read verses 28 through 29. It's kind of jumping into the middle of this. He says, you will dwell in Moab, leave the cities and dwell in the rock. And he says, and be like the dove, which makes her nest in the sides of the cave's mouth. We have heard the pride of Moab. He is exceedingly proud of his loftiness and arrogance and pride and of the haughtiness of his heart. I said, um, Edom is Moab. So we see what was the problem with the Moabites? What was the problem with the king of Moab? What was wrong with them? Their pride. Their pride kept them from doing the right thing. Their pride kept them on their path of arrogance against the Heavenly Father. Over in Obadiah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, real quick, the, in the minor prophet, Obadiah, I want you to notice here what he says about this. Obadiah, chapter 1. Notice in verses 1, the first three verses. He says, Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord. And a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise and let us rise up against her for battle. Now here's what the word of the Lord is. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground. Though you ascend as high as the eagles, and though you set your nests among the stars, from there I will bring you down says the Lord. Now, I use these as examples for the lesson to show that the, the pride that Jesus says that defiles the individual there, the things that come from within is that which defiles of man. This has always been a problem. You're going all the way back through the history, and you'll find that those who humble themselves before the Lord would serve the Lord. Those who refuse to humble themselves it was because of pride, arrogance, and haughtiness. And the ending was never good for them. Let's look at a couple of passages that Solomon, from the writings of Solomon, that expresses some very good thoughts regarding 
this type of pride, this arrogance, this haughtiness. We'll start in Proverbs chapter 16, and let's start there in verse 18 real quick. There in Proverbs chapter 16, let's start there in verse 18. He says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. I mean, it's that simple, isn't it? At least the concept is that simple. Pride goes before destruction. Look at the history of God's people. In our Sunday morning Bible class, we started a lesson looking at the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And one of the things we'll talk about as we get towards the end of that lesson is, can we learn lessons from the Old Testament? And the answer is yes, we can learn lessons from the Old Testament. This is one of them right here. The statement that Solomon makes has uh, evidence for the truthfulness of this statement there. A number of times, time and time again, individuals have fallen because of pride. Look over to chapter 29 now. Chapter 29 of Proverbs is verse 20 three here. He says, a man's pride will bring him low. That's the idea of falling again, okay? A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. It is better to start out with humility than it is to start out proud, proudful, and be taught humility. It really is. Um, and the problem is, is that oftentimes, like with the children of Israel, they would be very proudful, very, very arrogant, and the lesson was quite stern, and it would reduce them to the point of humility. Now, unfortunately, for them, but in accordance with the scope of the new covenant needing to be established, they would repent and turn back to God. He would restore them. And then after about 40 years or so, they would get this pridefulness back. They would turn away from him and then he would take them down again. Oh, there's a whole course of the judges where we see this happening and throughout the history of Judah time and time again. But this is what we as Christians have to understand. And Paul, Paul tries to make this point for the Christians in the first century. That this type of pride that we're talking about, this humility, this arrogance is going to stifle the growth of humility within our lives. Romans chapter 11 is a very interesting passage. The context really is not dealing with what we're talking about here as far as the primary subject here. But there is a warning in this particular chapter here, and we'll read it here in just a second. Paul is talking about the Gentiles and how, what, what made it possible for them to become children of God. Well, the answer was very simple. Those who were Jews who rejected Christ, they were the branches that were cut off. And so since like the olive tree, the branches did not bear fruit, they, they were not receptive to the word of God, they were cut off. So that means that there was a space now made for the wild olive branches, which represented the Gentiles. And you study the book of Acts, you see this quite clearly, especially in Acts chapter 15, Peter makes the point that the Gentiles are subject to the law of God. And Paul and Barnabas says, look at, look at all the people that we went to talk and, and, and the power of God and how it was displayed. Well, good news, Gentiles can be saved, but here's the warning to them. Beginning in verse 19 of Romans 11, you will say then, branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand in faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Now, the, when he says he may not spare you either, this is not saying, flip a coin, you don't know whether or not you're going to be saved. He's not saying that. He's just saying, listen, if he was willing to cut off the natural branches, that is the Jews who rejected Christ, if you who are granted in because of your faith make the same mistake, if you walk away from Christ, he'll cut you off as well. He'll cut off you as well. The Jews had an opportunity to be truly in fellowship with God. You think about the Old Testament time frame, the, the closest they would come to God would be in a manner of speaking, of course, would be standing outside the temple or going into the courts that were allowed, whether now you're talking about the temple that Solomon built, then later the Herod would build. But fundamentally, the closest they could get was the outer edges of the temple. That was it. 
Now, the priests, they could go in, and so they get a little bit closer to God, because the most holy place was not was the, I say the dwelling place of God. It was where his presence was they would go to. Once a year, the high priest would go in, and he would be there. Just John the father, or John's father, Zacharias, is an example of that, would go into the most holy place and offer the sacrifice, the, the yearly sacrifice. All right, that's as close as they got. That was fellowship for them. For us, we now have something far different. We are the priesthood. Okay, We are, and if you look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 6, we are the temple. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of God. And so now what they understood as fellowship with God, and the word really isn't used like that in the Old Testament, we see as a more closer drawn to God type relationship. We walk in fellowship with him. We are the priest. Jesus is our mediator. We know that when we pray to our father, he will hear us. We don't have to go through the priest to, to, to serve as a go-between. We can pray to our heavenly father. The mediation has been done by Christ when he died upon the cross of Calvary. And so when we stop and we think about what we have we need to understand that just as God was willing to grant us, us this, we can be cut off from that fellowship if we choose to walk away. If we let pride and arrogance get in the way. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, the Apostle Paul warns Timothy about those with a haughty uh, a mindset. 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, he says, For men will be lovers of themselves, he says, lovers of money, boasters, proud. Um, I believe this proud is a similar word to the, the pride that we saw in Mark chapter 7. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, they're bringing that word in now, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And he says, from such people turn away. This type of pride can be somewhat contagious. Um, if you allow yourself to be around such type of influences, this haughtiness could become a part of our lifestyle. And so our godliness now becomes a form of godliness, no longer being as it is supposed to be. James 5, or James 4, tells us that God, that this pride um, will separate us from our Heavenly Father. Notice there, James chapter 4, come down there in verses 6 through 10. Notice what he says. <clears throat> but he gives more grace, therefore he says, notice this, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then he says, therefore submit to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. What, we've said this before. The, singular, the following phrase puts within the mindset of the faithful child of God great joy. And at the same time, in the one that's not serving God great fear. And that is this, God knows your heart. Think about that. God knows what's in our heart. Another such statement is God will be the judge. That's another one. Okay. But God knows what's in our hearts. So when as a faithful child of God, we pray to him, we ask him to forgive us of our sins. We, we, we make petitions of him. We know that he's looking into the very heart of who we are. He knows what's within our mindset. He knows the sincerity or the lack of sincerity. He knows the godliness that is there or just the form of godliness that is seen outwardly. He can differentiate between these. So that's why it is so important that the humility that he's talking about begins and is rooted within our hearts. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. The question that we all have to ask of ourselves, and this is not a question that you look at someone else and point fingers towards. We have to ask ourselves, 
Have we truly humbled ourselves before the Lord? This is a fundamental concept that Israel rejected, and many people today reject. Many people will profess a belief in God, but they're not willing to humble themselves before the Lord. They're willing to, to go to services a few times a year, but they're not willing to truly humble themselves before the Lord. We can have a form of, of godliness and still have within our hearts the pride and the haughtiness that, that, that defiles the soul. And here's what I find very interesting, because this is true for everyone sitting here. You know what goes on up here in your mind. We all do. Okay? You stand there in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror, you know what that person is thinking in the mirror. You know what that person is thinking. You know the motivation. You know the love for the Lord. You know everything that is going on in that person's mind in the mirror. You know their weaknesses. You know their struggles. You know their victories. You know their failures. And that's not a bad thing. Because when we are open and honest to what goes on within our minds, within our hearts, and who we truly are, then we begin, we can begin to make the repairs. We be, can truly then begin to see how we need to change, if we need to change. See where we might need to strengthen ourselves in our faith to God and in our service unto God. Now, is it possible for someone to deceive themselves? Absolutely. Anyone can believe a lie. If you tell it long enough, you'll even begin to believe it. But even then, I think at that moment, if you peel away the lie while you look at that person in the mirror, you know what the truth is. And so I'm encouraging all of us to make certain that we do not defile our hearts with pride. That we humble ourselves and maintain the humility before the Lord. So that one day we'll be able to stand before him. It's interesting that the Hebrew writer talks about us being able to boldly go to the throne of grace or boldly approach the throne of grace. He's not talking about an arrogance there. He's not talking about a haughtiness, nothing like that. He's just talking about one who has faith in God, trusts in his promises, and is living his life in faithful service unto God. And he believes the promises of God and will boldly go before the throne of grace. If you're not a Christian, you need to get a hold of the pride because pride might be causing you to not to submit unto Jesus Christ. If that's the case, let's go back to his word. Let's get back within his word and see what all he's done for you and the, the wonderful promises made by God to those who will submit unto the gospel's call unto salvation. Make the decision, if you believe that Christ is the Son of God, to repent of your sins. And, and, and we will ask you, if you believe that Christ is the Son of God, you make that public confession in front of us. Be buried with him in baptism so you'll rise up then to walk in newness of life. Now live your life without pride, but with humility and service unto God. If you are a Christian and this type of pride, this arrogance, this haughtiness of which we've spoken this evening has been hindering your service unto God, then it's time to repent. Humble yourself before the Lord. He will forgive you. He will lift you up. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.